I'd like you to grab your Bibles. For the next few moments, we're, we're going to start in the book of Hebrews tonight. We are uh, we're in a radical time in the world, aren't we? And so much is upon the landscape of the nations of the earth. Things that Jesus told us, there will be wars and there will be rumors of wars. And I know that this is a a body of watchmen, <clears throat> and I know that you are, you are alert. I know you are sober-minded. I know you are watching among the nations. You're watching our own nation. I know that you're praying over the very safety and the well-being of this nation. We're in a critical time, very, very critical, urgent hour. And I praise God that for such a time as this, you and I were born and placed in the earth. This is our time. This is our assignment. This is our watch. And this is the time where the church arises in power and victory. And we don't back up. And we don't, give, we don't fold and give in to fear. But the ecclesia arises in power and in victory. We have clarity of the hour. We're not those that are blown by the wind, tossed to and fro. Come on, are you hearing me tonight? Are you hearing? We're anchored in the Lord. We're not drifting. We're anchored. And we're safe in His keeping. Amen? Are you safe in His keeping? Well, that's about half. Are you safe in His keeping? Well, there's the church. Just making sure we have it, have uh, believing believers in the house tonight. Very familiar text, and there's so much I could set up ab about this, but I felt like this is where I wanted to begin tonight. Of course, I believe the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and, and he was setting things concerning how we have come into the kingdom of God, that we've not come to Mount Sinai, but we've come, we've come to Mount Zion, to the city of God. Amen? Verse 25 goes as he as he builds this case of who we are as children of God he says see that you do not do not refuse him who speaks for if they did not escape <clears throat> who refused him who spoke on earth much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth but now is promised saying yet once more i will shake not only the earth but I will shake also the heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things which cannot be shaken. See that tonight. The things that cannot be shaken, that they will remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace. By which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hallelujah. See that the shaking is to reveal this. That that which is on faulty foundations in the first place, it must go. It has to be shaken and brought to nothing. But the greater revelation is to show us that that which cannot be shaken, the kingdom that we have received as an inheritance of the kingdom of God, as a son and daughter of God, it cannot be shaken. And ladies and gentlemen, shaking, shaking is only going to continue to increase until the ultimate return of the king of glory himself. As he comes for his bride and his church and he establishes his throne on earth as it is in heaven. I tell you, King Jesus is coming. Can you lift up a shout right there? I said, King Jesus. Come on. King Jesus is coming. Is there a Maranatha cry in your spirit? Hallelujah. That's right. That's right. It's a sobering time. It's a unique time. There's so many shifts. It's happening Globally, in the nations and governments, I mean, so many, so many unusual 
things are beginning to really manifest. I don't know how many of you saw, even in this last week, the deal that, that China itself brokered between Saudi Arabia and the nation of Iran. Sobering stuff. Ama amazing things. And of course, this is a this is a sign and a trigger that they're doing everything they can to plummet the American dollar. Unusual things are just taking place. And it's happening, the, the fight is happening on every level. We, we, we see it happening in education, with indoctrination. We see it in media and arts. We see it in government. We see it in the church. Uh, we, we, see, we see a fight in the, biz, the business mountain right now that is just wildly horrendous. You know, March 8th, which was just less than two weeks ago, was what they call International Women's Day. How many of you knew that? International Women's Day where they celebrate women's rights and they celebrate equality of women's rights. And so um, the, the businesses are just bowing down to this woke agenda. I, you know, many of you saw how Hershey took on International Women's Day and they had a biological man dressed as a woman uh, go before their company and offer bars that were her, she. Did you catch it? And um, this, this trans movement is demanding that everyone bow down and worship it. And, and as for us, as the church of the risen king of glory, we're not going to be silent about this, folks. We're, we're not going to be backwards. We're not going to back up. We're not going to be silent. We need to be a voice that denounces this. This is it's such, it's such an evil. It's such a, a perversion. Of course, that's the trickery of the enemy. He, he tries to pervert everything, everything. From the littlest of children right now, he's trying to pervert and, and, and put seeds of wickedness in every sector of society to pervert it. It's unbelievable. And we're seeing radical things just everywhere you look. And so many of you in here, and I can't even keep up with all y'all. That's, that's Kentucky language. For, that wasn't tongues. We didn't need an interpretation. That, that's, that's Kentucky language. So many of you send me all these things. Pastor, have you seen this? Brian, have you seen this? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> but what we see, we see God bringing his plumb line of truth to every sphere and sector of society. And Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Jesus Christ is the very plumb line of God. Now, many times when we say plumb line, of course, those that understand Scripture, we, we think about the prophets concerning the plumb line of God. We think about Isaiah. We think about Amos. We we think about Jeremiah. It's all through there woven the plumb line of God. But the plumb line is a person. And when you set Jesus in the midst as the plumb line of God, as the plumb line in truth, everything is going to manifest and everything is going to come into the light. And it's going to bear witness. When the light comes into the world, he bears witness of who people, who truly their father is. And the light is being even made more manifest. There is a greater glory of God that is rising in the earth. And it is causing everything to be made manifest of truly what fruit it is of. Are you hearing me? I think it's a, I think it's a moment in time that it is a uh, who's on the Lord's side moment. Are you with me? It truly is. It's who's on the Lord's side? As for me and my house, come on, we're going to serve the Lord. It's a moment where we've got to decide, and I've, I've said before, you know, you can look at Joshua 5 when, when, when Jesus manifested in the Old Testament. It was the theophany. It's before the incarnation of Jesus. The incarnation is when Jesus became flesh, but you see him in the Old Testament. And there was a time where Jesus showed up before Joshua, and Joshua was absolutely clueless to this manifestation of God because he had, he had known the glory of God and the cloud, you know, by day and the fire by night and the manna from the sky and the ark and all of those things. But then the Lord showed up as the commander and said he was there to actually take over. He was in charge. 
He was in charge. And so I say to you tonight, who is on the Lord's side? And we need to be a people who are stepping forward and saying, as for me and my house, I'm on the Lord's side. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to give in to concessions to this. We're living for the greater glory. There's times, folks, there's times of greater shaking ahead. But there's times of the greatest glory. The greatest glory being poured out upon the sons and the daughters of the living God. And people will see and know there is a great God, a living God, and his son is Jesus. Come on. Let's give him glory in the house. Come on. Let's give Jesus glory. Let's give Jesus glory. Come on. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Well, as for us as this house, we're, we're praying that God would make us a house of his glory, a people of the glory. And that God would canopy our city. He would literally canopy our city. And that the canopy of his glory would be known over the southwest Florida region. And that God would build his house, these living stones who we are. God would, he would build his house. He would build his tabernacle. And we, the true church, are about to experience a greater glory. I say it because the Lord keeps saying it to me. And I have to say it and keep prophesying it by faith that we're going to be walking right in the midst of the greatest outpouring and the glory of the Lord, the greatest outpouring the earth has ever, ever known before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a time of shaking. It's a time where the fear of the Lord is being released. And God is doing it throughout every sector of life. And we see the shaking. And it's a fear of the Lord moment. It's a moment where we need to look circumspectively and say, Lord, have your way in me. Cody, thank you for leading us in that. I remember when that song came out of Hillsong, Darlene Check. Didn't Darlene write that? Powerful song. It's a song of consecration. So we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 40 tonight. Go there with me. And I want to establish some foundations in this word. I don't know how long that I'll go. And, um, but I want, to, I want to obey the Lord tonight. <clears throat> because though there's great shaking, there's great glory that's coming. Of course, we know, we know what Isaiah has said about that darkness will be covering the earth and even deep and gross darkness the people. But the glory of the Lord shall arise upon us. The glory of the Lord shall be so manifested and witness upon us that people will come from far and wide, far and near to see that there is a living God. But we're also seeing the, the sword of the Lord or the acts of the Lord come upon and bring judgment upon. All of that which is anti-God, all that which is anti-Christ, and we're seeing it in every sector, and we're even seeing it in the church. We're seeing, and I say this in the fear of the Lord, we're seeing the Lord really deal with His church and cut away the things that are excess, the things that are gimmick, the things that are hype, the things that are noise, the things that are truly not even life-giving, and we're seeing the Lord take an axe to it. It needs to be removed. I appreciate that. Amen. I said it needs to be removed. So Jesus, before we dive into Isaiah 40, Jesus, when he made his way into his father's house, he had a mission in mind, and that was, I'm going to clean my father's house. I'm going to purify my house. I'm going to clean my house. I'm going to, I'm going to purify the house, and I'm going to make my father's house a house for all, uh, for all nations, a house of prayer for all nations. It's the, it's the father's cry. But when we think about the house being set in order, we need to understand this is, this is an intense and messy work, and, and, and I joke, and as I do. Uh, so often, you know, people see Jesus as uh, really meek and mild, but they don't see the Jesus that comes to really overturn the tables and deal with the issues at hand. 
they're, they're always okay with Jesus coming in and turning the tables in the temple. And they, 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 they listen to that subjectively and they stand back and they applaud. But when it comes to Jesus really coming in and overturning our tables of religion and the things that, the things that are, you know, there's no life in them, whoa, it's a different story. And so Jesus is not floating around, you know, like Brad Pitt in a, in a nice white nighty and flowing hair and just blessing people. Jesus is all powerful. Jesus is all powerful. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. He's the, yes, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the judge. He's the judge of all the nations. He's the shepherd of the nations. Come on. He's the judge. He's the judge of all the nations. He's the shepherd of the nations. He's the king of the nations. And he's coming to judge. That's a, fear, that's a fearful thing. He's coming to judge. He's going to deal with all unrighteousness and wickedness. He's going to deal with it. And there isn't anything that's gone on that isn't going to come underneath his jurisdiction. He's going to judge it all. And he's going to give it the right penalty that it deserves. Never lose sight of that, ladies and gentlemen. Never lose sight of the authority. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And he's coming to exercise his authority and his rule and his reign. Never lose sight of it. We know that when Jesus came in, Matthew 12, and we're going to look at this in a little while too, but I want to set this in your, in your teeth tonight and in your bread tonight as you're, as you're mealing. When Jesus went into the temple of God, he drove out all those who sold in the temple, overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, and it is written, my house... My house, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have meant it, you have made it into a den of thieves. He came and he set the house in order. He said, You've you've made you've made the house into something it was never meant to be. It is it's been perverted. What's going on here has been perverted, and I've got to come and clean the house and set it in order. And the Lord released his plumb line of truth to bring his house back into alignment with heaven. And so, I'm in Isaiah chapter 40 tonight. And I want to look at a prophetic word concerning John the Baptist. He was the greatest of all Old Testament prophets. He appeared just before Jesus' ministry. He's the one who declared Jesus to be the Lamb. That takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. He saw Jesus coming. He saw Jesus come down into the waters of repentance. He saw the presence of God rest on Jesus and remain on Jesus. John the Baptist heard the voice of the Father from heaven in those waters of baptism. He heard the voice of the Father. He saw the Holy Spirit settle down upon Jesus and remain upon him. I've always referred to this of Jesus' bar mitzvah. We never see anywhere in the natural that Jesus was bar mitzvahed by his father, Joseph. But he was bar mitzvahed by his heavenly father, and it was spoken over him. This is my beloved son, in whom now I am well pleased. And for 30 years, Jesus prepared himself for three and a half years of powerful, supernatural, world-changing ministry. Listen to the words of John the Baptist. He said, Is the voice of one crying in the wilderness? Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. And every mountain and hill brought low. And the crooked places made straight. And the rough places made smooth. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I love the apex of that, of what it, he's saying this is what it looks like when the, 
When the kingdom of God comes, and Isaiah is a very prophetic painter of the canvas. His words are so powerful because he's saying every, every low place of brokenness and humility, when the king comes, the Lord steps into that and he raises up those that are humble and broken before him. He lifts up the places of the valleys, the, pla- the places of arrogance and haughtiness and loftiness and pride. When the king comes, he brings it low. That's what the kingdom looks like when he comes. But then he says, ah, but also this, the rough places, they're going to be made smooth. Oh, say amen to that. But then the glory, the glory of God's going to be made revealed. Well, Matthew chapter 3 tonight. Stay with me. Matthew 3, and I'm beginning to read in verse 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one cried in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. See, you understand that John John knew his identity. John understood his identity. He understood his prophetic destiny of what he was stepping into to prepare the way for Jesus. Now, John himself, he was clothed in camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was... Locusts and wild honey, that is quite a diet. Wow. Then, Jer- then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Let's just stop right there. Look at that. The entire region all around the Jordan, Jerusalem, all Judea, they were going out to him and confessing their sin. I, I just say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that is a real ministry. A friend of mine, I was listening to his testimony concerning the Asbury re- revival this past week. And he visited there for many days. And what some of us have not heard, he said at each altar call, he said There's no, there was no, no room in the altars. They were taking them to an overflow room immediately. He said, but what was happening, he said, they were so broken, they were so weeping, broken over their sin. There was such a humility. There was such a confession, an open confession of their sin. And there were so many that were manifesting, not an exaggeration. He said, nearly 70% of all those that were answering the altar call were being set free in the back from demon spirits. Powerful. They came confessing their sins. Man, can we see a revival like that again? I mean, folks, can we see a revival like that again and see the grace of God sweep in upon a generation again? That's what we're going to see. That's what we're going to see. But when, ah, John, John, here, here he is, man. John. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to his baptism, he said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Notice that's John being very pastoral. (laughs) Therefore, here it is, bear fruits worthy. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. And so John was not, he was not appealing to water the gospel down. He knew his assignment. He knew it was to call people to prepare the way of the Lord and to thunder this word. He wasn't trying to make it inclusive to all, but he was calling all men to repentance. Are you with me? And do not think to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. That's so powerful. There's so much there. You can't trust in your religion. You can't do it. In fact, in fact, in reality, what Jesus did is he began to build his church with living stones, and that's you and I. And Jesus even said, you tear this place down, I'll rebuild it in three days. Glory to God. He said, but even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. This is, this is a powerful statement. 
He can now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. I indeed baptize with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me, he's mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. Verse 12, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. I don't want you to miss this. Look at these powerful words because John is speaking to us about the coming ministry of Jesus. And all the while, so often we think of Jesus' ministry of being so sweet and full of love and full of kindness and full of grace and our good shepherd. But when he says the winnowing fan is coming, what's happening is when the winnowing fan comes, it separates between the wheat from the chaff. It separates between what is pure and profane. It separates between that which is fake and phony to the genuine and the real. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Nothing is hidden in the light of God's presence. The Father released His light. The Father released His plumb line. And He said, oh, I'm telling you, when He comes, He's actually going to separate. And he's going to burn the chaff up with unquenchable fire. This is strong language. This is strong language. And when you set Jesus in the midst, what you're going to find is right away, you're going to, you're going to see the separation. You're going to see where people, where they stand. When the plumb line comes in, there's only two things that can manifest. When the plumb line comes in, there's only two things that manifest, sheep or goats. There's only two things that manifest, lovers of God and haters of God. And they manifest strong. You get the plumb line of truth in the midst of this culture, you're going to have a manifestation on your hands. And it's going to be a manifestation of the lovers of God and the haters of God, the worshipers of God and the mockers of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And this has to be the hour where we see the plumb line of truth. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the truth of heaven has to be set in the midst. And you'll find out real quick where people stand. Hallelujah. Psalm 1-4 says, The ungodly are like chaff, which the wind drives away. What's he saying? He says, They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. Now, I want, to, I want to capture something. I want you to go to the, the book of Mark, Mark 11 tonight. And I want to capture something that's very interesting. This is right after the triumphant entry of Jesus on the donkey riding in with all the palm branches before him. And I'm going to begin to read in verse 12. Now, the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Who's he? Jesus. He was hungry. Lord, give us eyes to see right now. Just, just continue. Release prophetic vision as we're laying foundations so that we see, Lord, what you are doing even in this hour in 2023. Let us see what you're doing in the nations. You're calling the nations to you, God. Seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. He went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs. Now, that's an important note because evidently Jesus expects fruit at all times. We're going to go there tonight. And in response to it, Jesus, now, now that, that's an interesting, in response to it, Jesus is having now a conversation with the tree. He, he's responding to a tree's lack of manifestation. Did you hear that? And says, he says, let no one eat fruit of you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now, notice something. The tree had the appearance of being very fruitful. Y'all saw that? Jesus draws close to it. Jesus begins to lift up the leaves. Jesus begins to inspect within the tree. But what he finds, to his surprise, what looked so fruitful was actually barrenness. There was nothing there. And sadly, oh so sadly, 
In this time, God is dealing with the very shallow, superficial church culture that we have believed is so full of fruit, but yet I wonder, what would Jesus say about it? I wonder if he would say it's a show. I wonder if he would say it's a circus. I wonder if he would say it's merchandising. I wonder if he would say it's nothing more than entertainment. I wonder if he would say it's just their cool program. Jesus is at the fig tree. Grab a hold of this. He is prophesying. Nothing is by accident. He is, he is on his way out of Bethany, back into Jerusalem, and he's dealing with something. And the manifestation of what he is actually dealing with with the tree is actually speaking to the very religious system that he is about to engage and rebuke and clean house. And you've got to tie the two together. You've got to see it all in its context, what God is doing here. So Jesus is at the fig tree, and now he's, pro he's prophetically aiming at something, and the fig tree represents Israel. You find this in, Hose if you're taking notes, Hose uh, <laughs> Hosea chapter 9, verse 10, Jeremiah chapter 24. I wish we could look at all of this tonight. We don't have the time. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 13. Israel is known as the fig tree. And so now Jesus is prophetically aiming at the religious system. What's he speaking to? He's speaking to a religious system that has been instituted in Israel that is doing something. It is covering their nakedness. And it is covering that they're actually separated from God. And it's covering and it's not revealing that they are now separated from the glory. It had the appearance of having fruit. And Jesus comes now to partake, to really inspect the house. It's not just about a tree. It's about him walking into Jerusalem and checking the fruit of what was really happening. And Jesus, he's the plumb line of God. He came to expose it. They weren't being clothed in the glory. Grab a hold of this tonight. This is strong. Jesus is, our, is the... He's our second Adam. He's the last Adam, according to Scripture. You want to find that, put it in your notes tonight. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. You can also find this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. But Jesus, he is the last Adam, which the Scripture says he is the life-giving spirit. Jesus is speaking to the first Adam, the way that he tried to cover his nakedness and his barrenness. And why? Because the leaf system revealed the glory had been departed. They were no longer clothed in the glory, so they were trying to cover themselves with something else. And he's prophesying, he's speaking to this leaf system that this covering must go. And the, and the covering of the glory must now come upon the people. Jesus cursed this leaf system because he was cursed upon a tree. But he was cursed upon a tree so that he could pour out of himself the glory and cover the church with grace. He became our covering. In verse 15, and so they came to Jerusalem. Read it with me. And then Jesus went into the temple, and he began to drive out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned their tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it into a den of thieves. And I want to give you language for that. You have changed it into something that is so far away from its original intention. Listen to these words tonight. You have changed it into something so far away from its original intention. My father's house was meant to be a house of prayer. It was supposed to be a place of encountering God. This is always the strategy of the enemy to come and pervert. Now, you think about this. In the realm of government, in the realm of authority, look how the enemy has completely perverted it right now. 
Look in the realm of education. Look in the realm of technology and AI. Look how the enemy has completely perverted it. Look how the enemy has perverted everything in the realm of gender itself. Between our roles as a husband, as a wife, as a man, as a woman. It's so far away from its original intent. But Jesus comes into the house and he says, oh, you've lost it all. You've lost it all. The house was meant to be the house of glory. That it would be a house of prayer for all the nations. And the scribes and the chief priests, they heard it and they saw that they sought how they might destroy him for they feared him. Now, we read this so much and I, I have to pause and just say, this is intense. They heard him and they said, we want to destroy him. What, are, what am I getting at? The point is, is that a religious spirit is a murderous spirit. I said a religious spirit is a murderous spirit. It is a very intense thing. It's nothing to be fooling around with. And this is what Jesus was up against. He understood it. He was reading it right. But the scribes and the Pharisees, they sought how they might destroy him. Because all the people were astonished at his teaching, and then evening had come. And he went out of the city. Now, now in the morning they passed by and they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Whoa. And Peter remembering, <laughs> aren't you glad Peter was there? Peter remembering, whoa, Rabbi, look. I said it like that because it has an exclamation point. <laughs> Rabbi, look. The fig tree from which you curse, it is withered away. And Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Or have the faith of God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says that this mountain be removed, cast in the sea, ho. And doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes the things which he says, they shall be done. He'll have whatever he says. And therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, you believe that you receive them and you will have them. You will have them. Come on, church. Come on. I've often wondered what Jesus might say to the church in 2023. Because we, we have seen the appearance of fruitfulness. We have seen the appearance of prosperity. We have seen the appearance of abundance like we have no need. Yet Jesus piercing words in the book of Revelation says you're still naked and I want to clothe you. I think the word to the American church in this hour, if Jesus would even be welcomed in the majority of churches, uh, is, is anybody's guess at this point. But I think his word would still remain the same. It is time to repent. Repent's not a dirty word. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Grab a hold of this. Grab a hold of this. Why? Because I want to cover you with my glory. I do not want you to try to cover yourself with a religious instituted system of just covering your nakedness with leaves. I want you to bear true and living fruit. And the only way you're going to be able to bear that fruit is if you abide in me. Because without me, you can do nothing. You must abide in him. Then you will be able to bear forth fruit. I think he would say, I want to deliver my church from the emptiness and the barrenness of a religious system. I think he would say to us, take my yoke upon yourself and learn of me. I'm lowly of heart. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. People today call sin sickness. Hear this again. People call sin today sickness. And so because they call it a sickness... They think that sin actually requires therapy. Sin does not require therapy. Sin requires repentance. Amen. 
King Saul needed David to come. He was tormented by evil spirits. And he needed David. He needed the shepherd boy. He needed the songbird. He needed the song of the Lord. He needed the sound of the Lord. He needed the harp to be played. Why did he need that? Well, what we understand and what we know in Scripture is that Saul longed for something. And this is what he longed for. He longed for therapy. But he did not long for repentance. Do you see the difference? I said, do you see the difference? Saul desired relief, but God was desiring repentance. And the Spirit of God is still calling out to us and to this nation, are you going to return to me, or are you looking for another reprieve or another relief, or will you humble yourself and repent and call me Lord and King and God? This is a sober hour. This is an hour that requires the real church, the church that knows God, to call upon Him for His mercy to save this nation. If we do not continue to pray, this, na this nation could not be saved. This is a sobering moment, ladies and gentlemen. I believe America is being saved in the process right now because the ecclesia is praying and because God is so merciful and gracious. I want to be broken over the sins of this generation. I want to be a man that can cry over the sins of this generation. I want us, I want to be a leader, that we're a family of tears, that we burn for this nation, and we can be broken for this generation. We can be broken for it and feel God's pain for it. That we can humble ourselves and call upon Him to save this nation. This generation needs a heart change, a true heart change of repentance, of brokenness, a realization of spiritual nakedness. And a realization of spiritual nakedness will take you to the blood of Jesus. You have to see how truly lost you are without him. And I, I, I just, you know, Cody's behind me and he's saying, Lord, I'd be a complete mess if it wasn't for your blood. And man, that's the truth. I don't even want to know where I would be without the blood of Jesus. I don't, I don't even know where I'd be. Thank you, Cody. I want to start closing tonight. I was talking to some friends this week about things that the Lord did in our family. And about how the Lord took the axe to the roots. This is what John said. He said, the axe is going to come down on the roots. And he said, and furthermore, the ministry that's coming after me is going to be so powerful. His winnowing fan is going to be in his hand. It's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Jesus' ministry was powerful. Jesus' ministry is still powerful. But what the Lord does is he brings the axe to the roots, the generational malfunction roots. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The things that trigger, the things that bind, the things that seduce. He takes his axe to it. He takes the sword of the Lord to it. And I was sharing a, a beautiful testimony, and I, I cannot, nor will I, share the depths of it. But it's important to me that when the Lord came and delivered my family, my family, from bondage, we were lost in a... A, a gross, gross darkness. Many of you know my mom and dad were raising me in nightclubs around a lot of rock and roll, around a lot of partying, around, around a lot of drugs and alcohol and a lot of stuff. A lot of radical stuff was going on. But something that was also in the DNA core of our family was, was a deep, horrible hatred for the blacks. And on my dad's side of the family... Um, that was very deep. 
And I'm not going to explain that tonight, but it was very real. It's something I'm still embarrassed about. I know the blood of Jesus cleanses, but it's still looking in my, my history. I'm embarrassed of that. It's just such a horrid thing. But God in his grace and his love and mercy released a man into our life. And I want to set something up to you to, to understand this. In the year 1979, in my hometown, uh, no blacks came into our town because the KKK was such a massive stronghold. If they came in by morning, there would be a, there would be a body found. It was an intense thing. And so God, in his love, his amazing radical love, released a man named Miles Black, a six-foot-two African-American who was a man's man. He was a man of God. He was full of the presence of God, the love of Christ. And God inserted him into our world. And because of him, and it's quite a story, but because of him, our entire, God used him as an instrument. But because of him, we came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's my point tonight. My point is this, is that God, so loving, but was, he wanted to bring the axe to the roots. He wanted to take the axe to the root and get that out of our root system so that it would never linger generationally. To God be the glory. But you know, beyond natural prejudice, there is also spiritual prejudice. I remember when, um, <laughs> just a transparent moment, I, I remember going past a ministry several years, well, many years ago. And um, I was really aggravated by this ministry on, on television and and the Lord spoke to me and said, you're spiritually prejudiced. And I was like, wow, what do you mean, Lord? He's like, you're spiritually prejudiced. He says, because you're offended at that man, because you are offended at his style, because you're offended at, you know, and he kind of just, he kind of went the landscape with me and just showed me my heart. He said, because you're so cut off and because you're offended in your spirit, you'll never receive from him unless you repent. I have said, you've heard me teach before, the gifts of God that we need in our life are actually found in the lives of other people. The gifts and the blessings that, we're, that we really need in our lives, that we really need, are found in the packages of other people. You just have to have enough discernment to know when they walk into your life. If you don't discern that they're a gift from God, then, then what will happen is you will miss the window and the opportunity for the grace of God that is in them to change you. Does that make sense? And the Lord was just showing me very clearly, you are spiritually prejudiced. And I want to reveal that to you because I want you to renounce it. I want you to revoke it. I want you to repent of it. And I want you to open your heart to a flow, to an anointing that I want to give to you that will change you. That changed my life, ladies and gentlemen. And so sometimes we're not only naturally prejudiced, but we are, we are spiritually prejudiced. And amazing tonight, we sang Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in his sight. And I've got it right here in my notes tonight. And I believe this is so, so important. And I want to hit this. People try to philosophically find God. But I can tell you, that's not the way to find God. You can't. Be all philosophical to find God. You can only find God through his son. And I want to tell you why you can only find God through his son. Because God is a family man. And God is a God of covenant. He's a family man. It has to be in the family. He's a God of covenant. And here's some advice. That if you want to live by faith, you've got to get away from prejudice. You're going to get my point in a minute. If you want to live by faith, if you want to enjoy and maximize the body of Christ for all that it is, you have to get away from prejudice, and especially spiritual pre prejudice. 
Because everyone that is born of God is in the family and in the kingdom of God. Whether they are male and female, whether they are black and white, are you hearing me? Red, yellow, black, and white. God is laying the axe to the root of strife and division in the body of Christ. God is laying the axe to the roots of strife and division in the body of Christ. And if He can heal us, then we can become healers. And we can also partner with people that are nothing seemingly like us. Are you hearing me? We're a family. And I want to declare this tonight. And I wrote these words today as I was in prayer where I felt like I needed the land tonight. But these words were power in my spirit. And I believe that there are words of spirit and life for you tonight. There is a true and glorious unity of the Holy Spirit that is coming in these last days upon the church to rise. A true and glorious unity. Not a compromised unity of concessions or inclusions or erasing biblical authority or, er or trying to erase biblical truth. And boy, don't we see that manifesting everywhere. It's a false unity. It's a, it's, it's a false unity of tolerance that has no lordship of Christ. And actually, it's a celebration of humanism. But what God is doing, he's bringing a unity of spirit and truth where the power of the Holy Spirit is going to make be made manifest. And where this power and where this covering of glory is, where this canopy of glory is, help me, Lord, where this canopy of glory is, where this covering of the glory of God is, where, the, where there is the removal of the institution of a, re, of a dead religious thing that tries to keep hiding its own barrenness. And God is saying, I want to remove it out of the way so I can cover you with my glory. And then you'll really begin to bear fruit. But if we come into the unity of the spirit and truth, then we're going to see radical healing and deliverance everywhere. Everywhere. And we'll be serving our city. We'll be serving our city. We'll be serving our region with people that are different from us. Their experience in God is very different from ours. The way that they see it is so different from us. But because we're walking in the canopy of, of His love, in the canopy of His glory, and we're people of His glory, we can come in. And they begin to blend into them. They can blend into us. And we're going to see a harvest and a breaking of the nets of the fish coming in all over this city and region to the glory of God. Come on, church. And so I want to pray that as they're shaking, that I would be bold and courageous to pray, Lord, let your acts come to roots that need to go. But I also want to pray, God, pour out your greater glory and let us be canopied by you. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. Lord, I thank you that you are making your church radiant and glorious. And you're cleaning your church, Lord. You're so good. You're so good. Your anger is just for a moment, but your favor is for life. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your long suffering. Thank you for your forbearance, even upon this generation, Lord. You're going to save this generation. You're going to save the children. You're going to save the children, Lord. You're going to rescue the kids. You're going to rescue the kids, God. You're going to rescue, Lord. For you are mighty to save, mighty to heal. Lord, we say shake all that can be shaken so that your kingdom, which is unshakable, 
will be standing strong, immovable, unshakable, unquenchable. And Lord, give us great courage in this hour that fear would have no place in us, Lord. And that, Lord, we would never try to do things out of a place of, of religion that's so false and so empty, but we would do it out of a passionate, burning love for you. And that your body would bear forth fruit because we are in you, abiding in you, O oh God. Let your glory canopy us, Lord. And let your fire be in the midst of us, Lord. Would you just lift your hands with me tonight? Next few moments. Lord, canopy us with your glory. Cut away and prune which must go. Cut away and prune that which must go so that we can bear more fruit. Fruit that will remain. Fruit that will bring you joy. And Lord, I thank you that in your true church, your glory is going to so increase. And we're going to see, we're going to see the things that we only dreamed we'd see. And we're going to stand in awe of what you are doing. In awe. Power and demonstration of your authority in the earth, Lord. Healing, deliverance, transformation of cities, transformation of cities and entire regions because the glory of God canopied. I pray that tonight over Sarasota and over the Southwest Florida region, the canopy of the glory of God. And I say again, Sarasota received the kingdom. Sarasota received the kingdom of God. Sarasota received the king. And Sarasota received the sword of the Lord. Received the axe of the Lord. Received the winnowing fan of the Lord. Hallelujah. Manifest yourself amongst us, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 Can we give the Lord praise tonight? Come on. Come on, praise Him. In the next few moments, let's just take care of some business in the house. Can we do that tonight? Shane's going to come in just a moment. We're going to give some announcements. I'd like our ushers to come. We want to serve you tonight. If you need an offering envelope tonight, lift your hand high. Ushers, come quickly. Serve the people. If you need an offering envelope tonight, lift your hand high. You can, of course, open your app. Go directly to give at our app, Victory FLA. You can download our app tonight, too, if you've not done that. Thank you for your faithfulness of giving. Faithfulness of giving to expand the kingdom. Hallelujah. Shane, come. Why don't we welcome Shane, too? Come on. Man, there's just such a phrase that you said that just stuck in my head. Jesus is in the midst, and Jesus is the plumb line. I just felt the weight of that. That's what really stuck. All right. <laughs> Let's... uh. Both, both men and women's house fires are tomorrow evening. Uh, Glenn Morrissey will be sharing with the men. Uh, he's going to be speaking on calling all disciple makers. Linda, Linda Davis will be sharing with the ladies freedom and forgiveness. For details and to register, please register. Uh, go to the events page on our app or our website. We have evangelism night Friday, April 7th at 6 p.m. We will be meeting right here. Uh, you have to be a Victory volunteer. Applications are at the book table. Uh, also, please register on that, um, on the app or the website. And we will be doing it at a different location uh, this time around as well. We have Resurrection Weekend coming up, April 8th and April 9th. 
baptism class is on uh, April 8th, right? Yeah, April 8th will be Saturday night at 4.15 here at the church. Sunday morning at 8 a.m. we'll be meeting at Ken Thompson Park. Sign up for baptisms. Uh, you can use the QR code or on the app or on the website. We have Vision Night April 14th at 7 p.m., which is a Friday. Please register on the app and the website for that. And our Unto the Lord uh, seven-day fast is coming up. Amen, right? There's a lot of excitement with that. <laughs> Honestly, that's a, such a great week, guys. Honestly. Uh, that will be April 16th through the 22nd. We will be having prayer each night at 630. Uh, there is an update on the Israel trip. Uh, please check the website for that. Um, we will be going to Israel September 3rd through the 16th. Space is limited to 40 people, so please sign up for that if you're, if you're praying about that and wanting to go. Uh, full payment is due on June 3rd. And we have the Life Amendment at the table in the foyer. If you haven't signed a petition for the Life Amendment, please do that. That will be to get the amendment on the 2024 ballot that would restrict abortion at conception. That's huge for our state. That's huge for our state. Honestly, because listen, Florida, unfortunately, Florida has become the hub of abortion because all the trigger laws went in place after Roe v. Wade was overturned, and we're still at 15 weeks. So that has that door has to close, guys. Amen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm not good at thank you cards. <laughs> I'm not good at uh, passing those out, but I just wanted to thank Everybody in here that's given uh, Janique and I a card, I thank you for all your kind words, all of your gifts. And honestly, last week was so special to Janique and I, and we just feel the love. We feel the love every week. We feel the prayers. But last week was so special, and we just want to thank every single one of you guys for the love, for the gifts, for the cards, the kind words, the hugs, the prayers. Thank you. We love you guys. You guys are our family. Amen. Amen. So good. Ushers, would you come? Amen. Let's pray over this tonight. Father, we thank you for every seed that we plant for your kingdom to advance. And Lord, you watch over every seed and make sure it will accomplish all that you send it forth to do. Thank you that it will release miracles and wonders for your glory. I pray abundance over our house, Lord, victory, a church of your presence, abundance, that there will be no lack in the house, Lord, that there will be prosperity and breakthrough on every realm, Lord God. And Lord, I also thank you that you have a miracle marked just for us in land, in property, in buildings, in this city, in this community, God, that you're going to release a wonder a wonder and a miracle, Lord, for the expansion of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that you've been giving us endurance. We thank you that you've been giving us patience, Lord, in this house. I want to thank you again so much for Restoration Fellowship. I want to thank you, Lord. We want to thank you for their leadership. Lord, we want to thank you for this family that has been so kind in opening up this campus and these doors to us, Lord. And we bless this house. We pray tomorrow morning will just be a splashing overflow of your joy and your goodness and your favor. And the glory of the Lord would be in this house as they come into worship, Lord. Thank you so much. And Lord, we thank you that you're, you've, you've already prepared the way, Lord. And you're going to bring us into that which you have promised. And we give you glory for it. And Brennan and I tonight, we speak the abundance of God over your house, over you, over your dreams. The goodness of God, abundance in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Ushers, go ahead and serve the people tonight. And if our altar team would begin to prepare themselves at this time. And when you're ready, go ahead and join me in the altars. We want to pray and we want to minister to all those that need a touch from heaven, a touch of God. Amen.
we're ready. We're ready to minister tonight. You're all I want. Take us, Sarah Cody. yesterday, today, forever. You're the same. You're the same, Lord. You're here, and you're here to heal, and you're here to heal. You're here to transform. You're here to save. You're here to deliver, Lord. Tonight, tonight, I want to open these altars as a team. We want to love you. We want to minister to you. Any level of need that you would have, what you're believing God for, I want you to come. Just feel free. Just slip right out of your chair. Come forward tonight. We're ready to minister to you. Let's stand tonight all together. Hallelujah. 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 May the glory of the Lord go with you this week. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Let the glory of the Lord. Amen. Rise among us with the glory.